Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Good afternoon. Um, as we always do, let's we'll open by thanking our uh, hostess, to Vicky and to Sunny for opening up uh, their home. Thank you so much. Um, today's class is the Fu'a Shalema of Chaya Sarah Bat Simcha, Ayim Yifael Ben Farida, Rachel Bat Mazal. And if you want to add in any other uh, names of those uh, who are in need of the Fu'a Shalema, Hashem should send us uh, health and happiness always. Mordechai Ben Yafa. Um, okay, so um, when I think about all of the diets that are out there these days, um, that's something that I think about a lot, but um, they all, pretty much all of them, except for one that I know, correct me if I'm wrong, they all pretty much sell something similar. They all do it in different ways, but they all sell something similar. And they're all selling quick results. Quick results, fast. I could lose X amount of pounds in X and Y amount of days, which is usually not too long. Um, and everybody is in search of a uh, quick fix, immediate gratification. That's the world we live in and that's what sells and that's what people buy. And they wouldn't exist if people uh, didn't buy these things hook, line and sinker. And the same goes for making money. Uh, there's a whole industry of get-rich-quick schemes that people uh, try to think up and come up with, and it works for a very small amount of people, but the overwhelming majority of us uh, who buy into it generally fail at it, the same way we fail at the fad diets. We can stick to it for a certain amount of time, but inevitably, we always come back to our other ways. We don't fix the root cause, and we end up probably gaining back more weight than we had originally lost, and we have to do the process um, all over again. And what it calls to mind is the idea that we are a very impatient society. Everything about our lifestyle is always about fast, quick, hurry, how I can do things in a way that by the snap of a finger, I'm going to see some kind of a result. And as a result, um, we as a society at large um, have very, very little patience uh, for things other than maybe a three and a half hour movie. But even that, I think people uh, really have a hard time. You find people reading books a lot less these days, not just because the movie is uh, visual and whatnot, but because people don't want to sit down and put in the time and the effort that it takes to read a book from start to finish. I'm sure this has happened to all of us. You start on a book, it's 300 pages, 400 pages. You get three, four pages in your mind and you start getting antsy. You start fidgeting. You start like, how much longer do I have? You start turning the pages in the back like, how far did I get? How much longer? Oh, is there a movie here? Let me just uh, let me just find the movie, right? And and so there's so many different things that go on, uh, so many different experiences that we're not having because we don't want to put in the time that it takes to get out the necessary results. We're incredibly impatient. People don't want to learn new languages because they think that if I, I should learn a new language in 30 minutes, I should be able to sit down and hear a conversation and I know everything about it. It takes months, years, maybe even a decade for a person to really master a language, to learn a hobby, to engage in something new and to develop their skills and to hone their talents really doesn't happen I went to pay twice. <laughs> in, uh, in, in our lives and anything that's going to be uh, Anything that's meaningful, anything that we want to accomplish is going to require a great deal of patience. Professional athletes did not reach the pinnacle of their fields because they picked up a ball and dribbled for 20 minutes outside and now they're ready to play in the NBA. They put in time, they often sacrificed everything else in their life um, to put in years and years of work and they saw very, very gradual results. So if a person wants to improve their foul shooting, they have to sit in the gym for a month shooting a thousand free throws and by the end of a month shooting a thousand free throws every single day maybe they got a one percentage point better than what they used to be after all that work they saw a small amount of result right but if you build that over a long period of time and you're patient with it that's how you become a master the people who become uh you know musicians have to work hours and hours and do tremendous amount of practice to be able to uh, to be able to accomplish those types of levels, and they only see the results of that in a very small way. 
Um, I think, think, you know, we started school now. All your children are in school. The same goes for students in school. Students become very impatient. They want to come in the first day. They want the teacher to make them laugh. They want it to be the best class that ever existed. And they want to get 100 in everything on the first day of school. It takes time to get into the rhythm of the, of the, of the year. You have to give a teacher a chance. You have to go in every day. You have to put in your effort. You have to see the results come gradually after you're willing to put in enough time and effort. One thing that we're finding all over the place is that young people who are going into the workforce are at record paces switching jobs very quickly. They go in, they stay at a company for six months. I don't like it, quit, move on, let me find something else. They're not giving themselves enough time to get to know the job, to get to know themselves. Do you really like it? To know whether you like a job or not, to do it for a long period of time, you have to actually do it for a long period of time. You have to really get into it. You have to see all of the different experiences. So our, our society is being plagued by the fact that we're not giving ourselves enough time to experience things. We're not being patient enough to start new projects and to struggle in the very beginning and continue to persevere over that and allow time to go on before we realize, hey, Look what we accomplished. I really like something. Um, going back to the diet situation, um, to me, the most effective diet that I've ever had, but is uh, up and down, but it's the hardest, in my opinion, to stick with because it takes the longest to see the results is Weight Watchers. But if I ever thought about it, on all the ones that I've ever done, um, to me, it's the most balanced, most rational, most level-headed one. And actually, I often believe that it's, uh, that it's in line with our Torah way of thinking. Torah is not about extremes. It's not about overnight results and successes. Torah believes that things should be done in moderation. Growth should happen slow and steady and consistently. And when a person is willing to put in the time and the effort and sacrifice that it takes because they believe something is meaningful to them, they will see those results over a very long period of time. I remember as a youngster, I was very impatient when it came to learning. I always wanted to learn a full masechet, a whole tractate in, in a week. I'm going to do nine pages a day, 10 pages a day, I'm going to learn it. So A, not only did I come to realize that it was very difficult to do that, even when I was able to do it, I realized I wasn't really learning anything. As quickly as I learned it, I forgot it because I wasn't giving myself a chance to process the information. When you're learning something new, your brain can only handle a certain amount of new information. And if you try to overload it, it just won't go in. That's why I tell students all the time, if you're cramming for tests, it, it doesn't work. It's scientifically, psychologically proven that cramming for tests doesn't work. You have to study gradually over the course of a long period of time to allow the information to be able to sink in. And I know that that's not a very popular approach for teenage boys and girls because they're under a lot of pressure and procrastination is just part of our lifestyle. But I tell them all the time, you're not going to do as well if you try to cram in the night before or the day of. Even we have cases of that as well. So I, I know that Hillel has a policy whenever they take um, English midterms or English finals, we have one Torah class in the morning because we believe in having Torah every single day. And then the students go to their final. And you can imagine the struggle I have teaching a Torah class knowing that they have a math final coming up in 20 minutes, right? Um, just imagine that for yourselves and you all with your kids. Um, but I try to tell them all the time. I tell them, if you study for your math test, I, I'm not going to tell you anything. It's not going to work. In fact, it'll probably hurt you more than it'll help you. Because all it'll do is it'll get you nervous about all the things that you think you don't know. You're going to get all down on yourself. You're going to get all harrowed. And there's no way your mind is going to be able to think like that. Your mind is not processing and internalizing information like that. It takes time. Um, it's been proven that if you study something before and then you go to sleep, you give yourself, your mind, the opportunity to store that information. The next morning, sometimes I remember something or know something even better than I did before I went to sleep because I gave my mind the opportunity to convert that information and to transfer it over to the memory storage parts of a person's brain. So in order for a person to learn anything, to be successful at anything, things that really, really matter in life, things that you really want to be able to accomplish, you have to be willing to put in the long-term um, efforts and sacrifice and have patience to see those results um, grow gradually. Um, change as a human being takes time and is also very gradual. Um, I mentioned learning a book and, and, and learning, a, learning a skill or some kind of a language or reading a book. So we have to be able to learn how to become more patient in, in our life. And that's really what I want us to talk a little bit about today. 
Um, so many of us feel very often that we are um, in a hurry, right? That we're running around, we try to multitask, we try to do so many different things at the same time. Or sometimes we really feel that we're very distracted. We're trying to do something and something else is uh, diverting our attention. And really, I think it's not so true. It's really, we're very impatient. Really, when a person sits down, like I said, to read a book and they're having their mind wandering, you know what's really happening? We want this to go faster, right? So we try to like skim things. We try to cliff notes things. We want, we, we try to push our lives to go quicker than what they really can go. Sometimes a person just has to let life unfold. Sometimes this is a very hard thing to do because we want to believe that we're in control of how the time goes and how fast our life is. That's, by the way, the reason why I think we multitask a lot. Why do we? Why do people like to multitask? If I asked you, what it, you know, how many people here multitask? You're cooking while you're helping your kids with your homework while you're doing that. Well, we all try to multitask, um, but all of us kind of know in our heart of hearts that multitasking doesn't really work. Am I right? Or people think that it does work? Huh? Just not for men. Okay. Uh, all right. What? I, I agree with Julie, right? I think that all of us, while maybe we can multitask, I'm not saying we can't, but I think all of us realize we're less productive when we multitask than if we probably compartmentalize and said, you know what? Right now, I'm just going to focus on cooking my dinner for Shabbat. Right now, I'm just going to focus on that one thing. I'm going to push everything else aside. And when I finish with this, I'll start with that, right? I think all of us would realize that if we, if that, that would be a much better course of action. But we don't do it. We try to, we multitask anyway, even though we realize that. Why? What did you say before? Right. It gives you a false sense that you're accomplishing more than you are in a shorter amount of time. It's giving you the sense that I'm getting things done very, very fast. Meanwhile, it's probably taking you longer to do each of those things when you're trying to do them simultaneously than if you were to do each of them individually and focus all of your attention on that particular thing. So chances are, if you are trying to cook dinner and help your kids with their homework at the same time, neither is going to come out really well. And it'll probably take you longer to do both of them than if you just said to your, your child, you know, give me 20 minutes. Let me focus all my attention on my cooking. Let me get all my Shabbat food in the oven. And when that's done, I'll sit down with you and I'll give you all your attention that I owe my attention that I need on the homework. A, the cooking will go a lot faster. B, you'll make a lot less mistakes because all of us have been there where we've made mistakes in the multitasking. You put salt into, into the bake, into the, into the cake, or you put sugar into the, into the food, whatever it might be. And all of us have been there make mistakes because we're really not wired to multitask. We're trying to do it, but our brains don't really want us to. That's not the way we're going to be effective. And we know this, but we, again, we want that full sense of we're accomplishing, we're scratching things off our list, but meanwhile, we're taking longer. The rabbis call this, I think I mentioned it in a previous class, they call it It's the short way, that's really the long way. And what the Torah wants us to do is the Take the long way, but it'll actually be the shorter way, right? So sometimes like when people don't really know what, think about navigating, right? If you don't really know where you're going and someone gives you directions, but you know, okay, I use only the streets that I know, which might take me a little bit longer, but I know these streets than when a person tries to tell me it's streets that I don't know, but it's shorter. I try to use the shorter streets. I end up getting lost and it ends up taking me longer than if I use the streets that I knew and I just made it there, uh, you know, being confident in what I had, right? So sometimes we think we're doing things in a shorter way. We're taking shortcuts. We're multitasking. We're increasing our productivity. And in actuality, our productivity is going down because we are trying to control time. We're trying to push things faster than they really are meant to be. In the end of the day, the roast can only cook in a certain number of hours. It has to have this many hours to be able to cook. And you can try to turn the, the temperature a little bit higher, but you know, if you do that, you're going to burn it. So sometimes we just have to sit there and say, this is the way it's meant to be. This is how long it needs to take. And so this is how long it's going to be. There's no way to speed it up. And so if we're trying to get faster than we know we're able, we're capable of doing, that's how mistakes happen, and that's how we don't uh, we don't accomplish what it is that we really want to accomplish. Questions, thoughts? Yeah. More different than expect anything because of how you and you're doing it better at it. So I mean, you know, the, the focus of thing feels better, but it does head to done seventeen things at the same time. If you do your homework with your child one on one instead of doing twelve other things, 
it just I, I think it, you get more product. Yeah, the results are going to be better. And especially if you're doing something like doing homework with your child, they're going to feel much that, much more of that bond that they're creating with you. Because a child knows very quickly if their parent is really paying attention to them or if their parent just wants them to go away. So if I'm doing three things at once and one of those is my child's homework, the child is not really going to think that homework is important to them or that my, my parent is really giving their attention, their full their full attention to me, Right. And so, yeah, those, those rewards are not, gonna, are not gonna come out. I'll give you a couple of other statistics. There's a fascinating statistic that uh, Amazon would lose $1.6 billion if their homepage loaded one second slower than it does. One second, yes, yes, research has showed. If it was one second slower, that's how, that's how quickly we are. If it don't, how many times have you loaded and you see the little blue circle come about and X, no, it's not working. Next website, next this, next that, right? Or the blue bar is coming like that. Click it again, click it again, right? We, we, we don't have tolerance for even a few extra seconds of things, right? The Wi-Fi is too slow. We got to bump up the Wi-Fi. Everything's got to go. Everything has to go so much faster in our lives. Think about dressing a little toddler if you have a very small uh, child at home, right? How long does it take the toddler to get dressed versus how long do you want it to take the toddler to get dressed? And so you're throwing the stuff on them and you're hitting that and then they they're, don't understand what's going on. In the end of the day, it takes a certain amount of time for a young kid to get dressed in the morning. It just is what it is. And so the more we try to push them faster than they can actually go, that's when my kids develop, they cannot put their shoes on the right feet because we're just pushing them, pushing them, pushing them. And they're just throwing the shoes on because they got to go as fast as they can. And my Hannah has no idea right and left. She's totally oblivious. And we had to actually, and by, and, and we had to deprogram it this whole summer. The counselors kept calling us. Your daughter keeps putting your shoes on the wrong feet. We couldn't get out of that, of that note. And we had to actually reprogram her, which if we had done it in the first place and taken the time to just show her how to do it, she would have learned it the first time the right way. When you learn something the wrong way, now to relearn it, to deprogram it and relearn it takes so much longer for a person to be able to do. So you're better off taking the time and the patience to be able to do it right the first time than trying to do it so quickly and do it wrong uh, and, and then have to you know, undo it. Um, some a, a, a particular sport that I hate because of this is fishing. Anybody, anybody go fishing? No, yeah, you use fishing? Well, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, I, I, I commend it, right? It's boring, but it also teaches you a lot about patience, right? You have to figure out, you have to just put the rod in your, and you got to wait. It's a lot, a lot of waiting. And that's why I think that a lot of people don't love fishing and uh, they are probably not going to get into it because, but to be honest with you, it's an exercise. People who have, it's, it's been proven, people who do um, sports like that, things like fishing, which take a long time and a lot of, they instill in themselves the, the quality of patience, which serves them very, very well um, in, other, uh, in other regards. There was a, there's a professor, an art professor in Harvard University, I wrote her name down, her name is Jennifer Roberts, um, who, when you take her art class, the first task that she makes all of the students do is to go to an art museum and they have to sit in front of a painting and they have to look at the painting for three hours. I have to sit in front of the painting and look at it for three hours. And she knows it's torture. She knows she's really putting the students through it. There was one person who, who uh, online who was describing himself doing this exercise. He goes, I sat there and it felt like forever. He goes, I thought no question. I was halfway done with the three hours. I thought for sure I was here an hour and 30 minutes. He looked at his watch. He was there for 17 minutes, right? <laughs> Um, so sitting in front of one thing, staring at it, looking at it for three straight hours. Can you imagine uh, doing something like that? And, and she does it and she explains why she does it. She does it because she believes that if someone is going to become a great artist or understand art, you need to have patience. You need to be willing to look at a photograph, at a picture, and not just move on from it, not just swipe it to the left or swipe it to the right or whatever it is that we're doing, to just to, to, to really appreciate it, to get a look at it, to see it, to understand it, to really make sense of it. Um, I think that's the reason why so many of us are vexed by art, right? Not, uh, not your brother-in-law, right? He, he, he gets it. But so many of us are vexed, but we don't really get it because we don't have the patience to sit there and look at it and try to understand really what's going on over here, to understand the artistic um, you know, drive and what was going through the artist's mind when they did it and how they detailed everything. But they said something fascinating. If you sit long enough by it, you start to find yourself attached to it. You start to find yourself immersed in it. 
you start to all of a sudden connect with the characters. If you surrender to the idea that this takes a long time and you're willing to change your mindset to say, I know this is going to take a long time. I know what I'm about to do is going to take a long time. All of a sudden, you enjoy the experience a lot longer. So if you ever need to do a really long drive, okay, the drive somewhere, right? If you're sitting there going four hours, five hours, I can't take it anymore. Within the first 20 minutes of that drive, you're going to find yourself losing your mind, right? But if a person comes to terms with the fact of, I'm going to have a great vacation, I'm going to somewhere, and it's going to take me five hours to get there, but I'm going to enjoy the five hours. That's how long it takes. There's no way to get it shorter. There's no way that I could cut corners. That's how long it takes. And you change your mindset. All of a sudden, you can live in the experience. You can appreciate the experience. The drive becomes uh, a lot easier. You find other things to do, and you talk to yourself or your children or your, or your spouse or whoever is in the car with you. And all of a sudden the drive becomes part of the vacation. Anybody here ever drive down to Florida? Nobody, yes? Okay, yeah. the, the, only one. Huh? It's not, a, a, you, you, a, a, more people than care to admit have driven down to Florida. Huh? Well, what's it like? Well, you were trying to escape the hurricane. Oh, okay. Well, that's a whole different, yeah. <laughs> I'm talking about like people who voluntarily drove down to like, yeah. So how was it? Yeah? Right. Oh, really? Right. Right. Did you drive back? Really, yeah. the drive back is much worse than the drive there. The drive back is torture, right? The drive there, at least you're looking Florida, this, that, it's something that. Right, I think that that's what it is. And if you realize that the patience that you're willing to give it will yield you much better results at the end of the day, I think that that becomes uh, uh, um, something that a person can then not only stomach, but also thrive through. I think you start to enjoy those experiences a little bit more. You relish the time that you're that you're able to have. So, you know, why is it that patience is so hard for us? That's the next question that I want us to try and answer. Why, why do people have a hard time being patient? Why do we get antsy? Why do we feel constantly distracted and in a hurry? Why, why do we have this negative relationship with, uh, with patience? Okay. But I think our I think our parents and grandparents may have also had trouble with it, right? So there's no question that the more instantaneous things become, the less tolerance we have for when things take time, right? Going to the store, picking out this, this you know, doing it now all of a sudden seems like impossible tasks for us to be able to do, right? So there's no question that that has had a major impact on us. But I'd also venture to say our grandparents and great grandparents also struggled with the concept of patience, maybe not to the degree that we do. And so what do you think the reason for that is? So Okay, I think that's a great point. Generally speaking, things that, uh, right, what is it, good things come to those who wait, right, that patience uh, is very hard because it takes time and it usually means that that thing is more challenging and as a result uh, it, we we are naturally inclined not to not to get involved in it I think that's also one thing I, I think there's also an idea that patience requires you to be passive it requires you to sit back a little bit right and human beings in general don't love that we don't love to to be passive we love to be doing because we want to feel like we're in control like we're pushing the envelope forward and so in order for us to really get out those results, we have to sometimes, there's another chair. Um, so see, I don't want to call you out like that. I just want to do um, But it requires us to, to kind of sit back and to be passive and say that I can't control it. And that's a very hard thing for people to do. To say that I'm not in control of this, but someone else is in control of this um, is very, very difficult. And, and that's where I think the Torah perspective could be very helpful for us. Because basically, emuna in Hashem can also impact our ability to be patient for things. So if someone is struggling with a life situation um, that is realizing that it's going to take time for them uh, to get pregnant, to find a spouse for something, it could be very, very hard for us to say, 
I have to wait it out and I have to be patient. And the longer it drags out, the harder it becomes. Um, and the more our emunah, our faith in Hashem, is really put to the test, that there is a time for when this is going to happen and that Hashem has a plan in mind. And then if I'm patient and I just continue to stay the course, if I believe that the course of action I'm taking is the right course of action, although sometimes it might call into question whether we might have to make some adjustments, which is always okay. But the fact that a person believes it will happen for me eventually because it's not in my control, it's in Hashem's control and it'll happen when it'll happen, that emunah has the ability to help us out to be able to be patient. And sometimes our impatience could be a reflection on the fact that we lack some of that emunah in Hashem. We feel like we should be able to produce this and make it happen. And when we are unable to, we get very frustrated and we get very, very upset. And we feel like the world is against us because we're not allowing Hashem to take the reins and God saying, you know, be patient. It's coming to you. It will, it will eventually get there. Keep, keep your... Keep the course, keep bettering yourself, keep reflecting, and the time will come for that thing to, to find its way to your way. And if it doesn't, it means maybe it wasn't in the cards for you, or maybe you set your sights on something that wasn't necessarily meant for you. So imuna and patience can sometimes have a relationship with each other. Or not, well, I have them now, but when you really put some text, you have them, you know, and the patience of writing something out. Is what, like when you have the trust that Hashem yeah. is going to be able to provide yeah. it for you. And when I'm bitachon are very closely related concepts, there's a subtle difference, I think, uh, between them. And Muna is really my thought process. I think bitachon is how I allow that thought process to govern my actions. Do I act? in accordance with bitachon. So my faith, my, my emunah, is how I look at the world, how I think about Hashem. And then my bitachon is when I act and when I behave, do I behave with the idea that I trust that Hashem will, that I, the, the, the Hashem that I believe in, that I have emunah in, will respond to me in kind based on the actions that he and I are uh, going through, sort of the tango that we're, that we're leading. So I, I definitely think it relates very much to patience, right? If a person is... Uh, pressing the envelope a little bit too much and doing things that they wouldn't otherwise do, doing things that are maybe not in their value system, right? Then they're allowing their impatience to, to affect their emunah. I'll give you an example of where this might be. Um, there are a lot of people who have very good faith in Hashem and believe and they pray and they trust that Hashem will provide for them, but then something's missing from their life. And they pray and it take, and a year goes by and they're not answering and they pray again, and they do chesed, and they do charity, and they say, and it go, a year, another year goes by, and it doesn't happen. And another year goes by, and it doesn't happen. And they start to get desperate. And what do they do in their desperation? They start to do things that waver from really what they believe in. They start to search for, like I said, these quick fixes. They start to search for a lot of mystical things that they don't themselves really understand or believe in. They start to go to certain people who will tell them what they want to hear or charge them a lot of money to do all kinds of, you know, hocus pocus type things. And what's happening in that situation, and again, I don't judge anybody for doing those types of things. When a person is really desperate, they will do a lot of things because in their desperation, they feel, I need to do more. I'm not doing enough. We want to be in control. And that's where the patience and the emunan bitachon is starting to waver. The person is compromising on who they are, on their value system, on what they truly believe, because they, they need something or they want something, and they're too impatient to be able to let the process play out, right? Um, and you could apply this in a lot of different examples. And I've had conversations with people, and I've said, who have told me, I'm doing X now. And I tell them, but you don't really, you don't really believe that. I know, but I'm desperate. I know, but I can't wait anymore. I can't take it anymore, right? And and, and again, you don't judge people in that. When people are in pain, you know, you sympathize with them, you empathize with them, and you understand why people are doing that. But that's where this type of a conversation, I think, could be very beneficial for people, where they say, don't compromise who you are and what you believe in in your emunah and Hashem, just because your impatience is, your patience is wearing thin, right? 
that's when you need to have a jolt of imuna and you need to strengthen and double down and say, it will be when Hashem wants it to be. I'm going to continue to pray. I'm going to continue to do the things that I believe in, that I've been taught, are the things that are really effective. I'm going to do more charity. I'm going to give more chesed. I'm going to try to turn my issue into a positive. Maybe if I'm struggling with X, I need to help other people who are struggling with that same problem and be a support for them. So you try to find ways that you can turn a negative into a positive, but within the belief system that you really have. And that's where I think patience uh, can be a virtue for us. Um, when people become impatient, they start to do things that contradict their way of thinking. They contradict their way of behaving. You know, a person who, I mean, let's take a step back. A person who, you know, is working hard in business and wants to earn a lot of money and it's just not working for them. They're doing X and it fails and they do Y and it doesn't work out. And this product and it doesn't sell. And they're starting to have a sense of growing frustration. Why am I not making the money? I'm putting in my effort. I'm praying to Hashem and it's not working. And then an opportunity to scam somebody in business presents itself and money is on the table. And now a person has a really big decision to go ahead and make. Do I continue in my course of emunah and have patience in the fact that I believe Hashem will provide for me and does provide for me whatever I'm deserving of and whatever I'm needing of? And if that, you know, and I have to continue to stay the right course in what I believe in, or does my impatience allow me to compromise on my values and to do something that I wouldn't otherwise do? And unfortunately, there's a lot of people in that situation who reach, who reach for the, the, the illegitimate money who do the scam, who gamble away, who try, who get tempted by that sense of, I can do this quickly because I'm frustrated that it's taking too long and they allow themselves to do something that they wouldn't otherwise do. And that, old, that compromises their imuna. So I definitely think that when a person has real faith in Hashem and then acts accordingly with bitachon to trust in Hashem, patience is going to be a major, major player in saying to yourself, I'm not going to compromise who I am and what I believe in. I'm going to stay it. And if Hashem finds it that it's worthy for me, he'll provide it for me. Maybe not now, maybe down the road. And I'm going to maintain my patience to see this situation unfold as it's meant to unfold. And so I, I, think, that that's the, uh, I think that that's a healthy way of thinking. But as you can imagine, it's a much, much harder way of thinking. Uh, it's much more difficult to do that. When that money presents itself, there's every temptation in the world that's saying, you'll just do it this one time. And you'll just do it that one time and it's okay. And, it's, and, and, and that's where the quick fix is. It's a much harder thing to do to be, maintain that patience and that imuna to, to stay true to who you are as a, as a person. Yeah. Very hard. Correct. Yeah, I mean, you have to say to yourself, I'm doing everything that I can. I'm doing what I believe in. I'm doing, and I, maybe there's some more things I can do within, the, within this framework, but at a certain point, I have to step back and I have to accept what it, what it, I have, to have it, an acceptance and say, this is what it is. And the truth is, maybe I need to look more positively about my current situation. How much do I really have that maybe other people don't have? How many people wish that they were me in that situation? So, you know, I can be patient because I have a lot that really warms me up and fills me up and and produces uh, together for my uh, together for my family. So this is something that I think we have to be more mindful of and try to do activities and things and exercises ourselves with our spouses, with our children that can try and uh, strengthen that patience muscle inside of us. Because it doesn't it doesn't happen overnight. You have to test yourself. You have to challenge. Like working out in the gym, right? The first time you go to the gym, you could do ten push-ups, and then you have to do twelve, and then you have to do fifteen, and yeah, it's something you have to exercise over time finding ways to be able to extend uh, your ability to have patience. And I think when we are patient, we'll start to gain more out of our experiences, our emunah and Hashem, I think will get strengthened. And I think we'll start to live in the time frame uh, that we have. I think another reason why people struggle with patience is because to be patient for something uh, is to recognize that we don't have an infinite amount of time in this world. And so the reason why people want to move so fast and the reason why people have a hard time waiting for things is because we realize that we are not here forever, right? And that's a very sobering reality. It's not something we like to keep on our minds all the time, but it's the truth, right? And we have to recognize it. We have to come face to face with it. So we want to go fast because we want to give ourselves the illusion that we're accomplishing more and doing more in the short amount of time that we're here. 
but the patience does the opposite for us. It makes us experience and enjoy that, and, and get the most out of the amount of time that we have over here. So if you're going too fast, you miss things. You miss your kid's childhood. You miss the opportunities that you have to spend time with your, with your spouse and with your family because you're moving at such a harrowed pace. You don't have time to just live in the moment, right? It's a problem that we have with our cameras, right? Every time we experience something, we experience it behind the lens instead of in reality. We'd rather experience, we today would rather experience things through a camera and through a video than we would experiencing it in real life. I even found myself saying this last night. And when I went home afterwards, I thought to myself, I said, it was kind of ridiculous that I even said it. Last night we had a Halal back to school night, right? So as a, as a teacher, now I got to take another hour and 20 minutes out of my night to come and to, you know, see the parents. And it's very, very, it's important. I'm not, I'm not belittling it in the least bit, but it's, it's hard. It's not easy. Uh, I like to get home just like everybody else and have a, have a relaxing night. And at one point I turned to a teacher and I said, you know, we could just do this on a video. Like, why do we have to, why do we have to be here? Like, why couldn't I just film myself? Here's what Chumash is all about and send it out to all the parents and let them watch the video, Right. And then I said to myself, and I said, I'm sure there's be a lot of parents who'd be very happy with that, right? A lot of parents who would never want to have to get dressed and come to the school and see me and this and have nine conversations. I'm sure there's a lot of parents who would love to just click their WhatsApp button and here's three minutes of Kumash and, and, and move right on, right? I'm sure there's a lot of parents. Yeah, we, 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 can, we can identify, we, we, we empathize. Yes, there's no question about it. But then I, st I stopped and I said to myself, but really, is that what is that what we want? Is that what we want to I, we want to prioritize here? I'm here. I might be a, a lot of parents. They might not know me. There were a lot of parents who came last night who didn't recognize me. I know there's like eight or nine or ten other teachers in the school that are brand new to everybody. I said, is that the first interaction that we want parents to have with their teachers' students? Is through a is through a camera? Are we really getting to a point where we? hate face-to-face -face interaction that needs to require a little bit more effort on our part that we'd rather do everything just through the lens of the camera. And I think, again, that speaks to our impatience. We don't want to get dressed and drive 15 minutes and go to the school and park and walk to the building and have to see. We'd much rather stay in our pajamas, lie down in bed, click a video and move on. But it's not the same. We all recognize it's not the same. It's not the same as seeing a real person. It's not the same as having a conversation. It's not the same as a number of parents who came over to me and introduced me. One parent came over to me and said, we're related. And I didn't even know. And I had to call my father. And I went, mean, oh, okay, so now, so now we're related to each other, right? So, but I would have never gotten that. I would have never experienced that. They would have never experienced that if we didn't take the time out to slow things down a little bit and to get that face-to-face -face contact. Um, now I had a conversation with all the students about what everybody does right before Yom Kippur, mass but come out with a text message, mass it to thousands of people that are over there. I mean, it's silly, right? It's silly at a certain point. I know people mean well, and I know people want to do the right thing, but does it really mean anything to anybody anymore to get 12 text messages from random people I've never even spoken to in years saying, please forgive me for anything that I've ever done to you over the course of this thing, and I, and I feel the forgiveness and have a great year? I mean, it's nice, but I don't really think anybody took any time out of that. I don't think it really meant anything to anybody. As much, probably out of the, if a person sends 500 of those text messages, one phone call to somebody will be more meaningful. It does more to you than one phone call. Don't have to have 500. Take one phone call, pick one person in your phone book to call and genuinely, sincerely ask them for forgiveness, wish them a Shana Tova, talk to them about that. That will be way more meaningful than a thousand mass text messages that a person can go ahead and spend. But we don't want to take the time to do that. And a random day, of course, it doesn't have to be. We're going to start small. We're going to start small. Right? A random Wednesday might be a little bit tough for people. It's great if you can do that. I'm not surprised that it's you who suggested Correct. That's true. That's true. But I think I think it means a little that, that, that a person at least took the time for phone call. And if I answer, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't get her. Something there. There was a face to face. There was a there was a conversation that at least uh, that at least took place. So. You know, if we are willing to accept the fact that we are let, we'll let ourselves slow down a little bit, that we don't have to move so fast, that we're not going to get to every single person in our phone book, but I'd rather get to 10 people and have it be meaningful than to get to 1,000 and it mean absolutely nothing. When we start to make those types of calculations and we allow the patients to get into our lives, I think we'll start to see our relationships improve with others, with ourselves, 
with Hashem, our strength, I think, will uh, and our our belief in Hashem, I think, will ultimately um, will ultimately become a lot a lot deeper. And you could definitely take the idea of patience and apply it to a very important part of our lives. And this is the last part that I'll that I'll mention is is anger, right? So when we often think about patience, it's not only patience in letting things develop, but it's also in potentially not getting angry at people. And it's the same exact concept. This is my Pirkei Avot for the day. The Mishnah in Pirkei Avot, in the fifth chapter, Mishnah 13, it says that there's a lot of different types of people. There are some people who are very quick to get angry, but also very quick to forgive. There's a lot of people who don't get angry very fast, but once they get angry, they're, very not, they're not very forgiving. It takes them a lot of time to forgive. Who would you say out of those two people is better? The person who gets angry quickly, but forgives quickly, or the person who gets angry slowly, but forgives a lot slower? Which one would you say is the, does the Mishnah prioritize? Why do you say the first one, Grace? Better to get angry quickly, but forgive quickly, than to take a long time to get angry and forgive quickly. You're supposed to forgive right away. Yeah. I'm not a big, I, I got to be honest with you, a topic, topic of conversation for another time, I'm not a big get off your chest person. I, I'm very, I don't, I don't like that. I never let my wife get things off her chest. I never let that happen, right? I just want to get something off my chest. I'm going downstairs. I, 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 I'm not here. I'm not here. That's why she's got, yeah, she's, she's got other friends. I call any other friends. I'm not, I'm not here to be a, your punching bag. You want to talk about something that I can help you with? I'd be very happy to talk about something that you think I can help you with. You want me to have advice? I know it's different for men than women. We're very, very different. Than that, but you want some, You want my advice? You want me to tell you? Because I'll tell you the difference, by the way. The difference between getting something off your chest and having a real conversation is you're willing to accept that I tell you you're wrong. When somebody wants to get something off their chest, they don't want to be told that they're wrong. They just want to let it go, and they want you to take it. I'm not a punching guy. I don't, I don't believe in that. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not a fan of that, right? If... Because the truth is, maybe you're wrong. Maybe you're going to vent to me about something and I'm going to tell you, I don't know if you handled that situation so well. And if you're not open to me, if you're not open to me answering that, then I'm, then what's the point? This is just less on that. And it's really just uh, a get out your feelings type session, which I'm not down for. It's just me. Right. Yell at them, let them know what they did wrong. Right. And typically, I'm asking you to know. Okay. So that's that's why it's the most important. So you're saying that's you're you're the you're the quick to anger, but quick to quick to let it go. Okay. So you're not gonna like what I'm about to say. <laughs> so what's what's actually what actually the Mishnah Pitavot recommends, you can't blame it on me. That's what the Mishnah says. The Mishnah says that it is better to be somebody who is le- who is more slowly angered but slower to forgive than somebody who gets angry more quickly but is quicker to forgive. They, the rabbis tell us that the act of getting angry in and of itself is uh, is a problem for a person. It, it harms the individual. It's not a good quality for a person to have. So even though you can bounce back and recover very quickly, which is a great positive, which is a fantastic thing, because obviously to be quick to anger and to be slow to recover is the worst of everything. The rabbis call that a shot. That's a wicked person. So that we don't want to be for sure. But a person who can control themselves to where they don't even get angry in the first place has a much stronger control of themselves than somebody who could forgive. I think the rabbis recognize it's easier to bounce back than it is to not get into the situation in the first place. And that's where patience comes in. How do we exercise our patience with people to not get angry at them in the first place? So we have to ask ourselves why we get angry at people. We get angry at them very often because we think we're right, because we instinctively assume that we have the answer to something, that they should be doing it the way that we're doing it. And we want to see them instantaneously do it that way, right? Instead of what patience tells us and not getting angry is, hmm, this happens. Right now, it doesn't feel so great, but let me think a little bit about it. Let me take a step back. Let me analyze the situation. Um, was there a better way to do this? Was there not? Is the way that I'm about to suggest really the way that I should be doing it or really not? Or maybe there's a conversation that I can have with that person in which the two of us come up with something that is better than what just took place. And now there's much more buy-in for the opportunity to correct the situation. So patience requires a person to put themselves second, to say, it's not only about me. 
and not to react right away to what happens, to not seek that instant gratification, right? So your child did something wrong. You have a choice right now. You can immediately insert yourself and yell at them and tell them what they needed to do right, right? Or I think you could take a better approach, a more calm approach and one that requires, however, patience, which is to ask them, say, what just happened? Do you think that that was the right thing to do? What could have you done? What could, what could you have done better? And by asking questions like that, which requires a little bit more level-headedness, requires a little bit more patience and stepping back, we allow the person who we want to correct their behavior to figure it out on their own. And when they figure it out on their own and they own it, it's much more effective, it's much more ingrained in them than it is if we just tell them what they need to do, right? So as a teacher, I'd much rather if the student's talking out and say, what's going on over here? Why, uh, you know, what are we doing right now? What could we do better? And if they are able to identify the behavior that was undesirable on their own, and then we're able to talk together and they can even come up with solutions themselves as to how they could do better, that's much more powerful. That's something that you'll see will yield much better results than me just getting angry and forcing myself upon the other person to tell them what to do. Now, it can be mean and scary, and sometimes that does work, right? But I think long-term, the other approach is more meaningful. And that's why the rabbis say the more a person can control their anger, the more a person can have that patience, the stronger their relationships will be, the stronger their emunah will be, the better the results they will yield, but it's hard. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to live a happier life, by the way because it's really, really hard and sometimes gonna really, really frustrate you to do it. But you will grow as a person and you will see the results that will come out and maybe those results will make you a lot happier. I'll leave you with a quick quote from the book of Mishle. Uh, if I can get my uh, thing working, the, 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 yeah, maybe yes, maybe no, no, maybe, I don't know. Do something, yeah, patience. See, I'm not, it's not working, just press. Press button to continue and I'm pressing the button and it is not working. So I'm gonna press this button we're going to try. Oh, there it worked. Okay. Creating patience. Very good. Good. Okay. Two points. Yeah. This, this is, we're learning in real time here. That's what's happening. <laughs> to finish it off, to finish it off, I'll give you one quick quote and one idea to take with you to the high holidays. The quote in Michelin, the book of Proverbs says, Tov erech apayim migibor. Greater is someone who has patience than someone who is strong. Physical strength, less impressive than someone who has patience. That type of strength, much more admirable, much more difficult. And somebody who can conquer their spirit, who can control their emotions to act level-headedly is greater than someone who can conquer a whole city. Conquering your emotions, being aware of your, your temperament is much more difficult, but also much more powerful. We often say in our prayers, Hashem, you are erech apayim. Note those words. We say Hashem, you are patient. It's one of God's 13 attributes of mercy. We're going to say it over 50 times on Yom Kippur, all day long. Erech apayim verav chesed. Erech apayim, erech apayim. We're saying to God, you are patient because we know if God wasn't patient, we would not be here. It would be much more difficult. God extends that patience to us because we're going to do the wrong thing in the same way that we have to extend it to other people, to our children, to our spouses, to our family members, to our friends. And that's what God is looking for. If we say to God, God, be patient with us, God says, well, are you patient with other people? Have you exhibited that quality towards others? If you've exhibited that quality towards others, I will give you that same gift in return. And so that's the hope. The hope is, is that we can work on ourselves to become more patient, to control our temperament, to not get angry at others. And that's perhaps the biggest advice that I could give you for Rosh Hashanah. We do a lot of things on Rosh Hashanah. We eat a lot of foods and a lot of siman tov and a lot of good things. The rabbis say, you know what the best way you can guarantee yourself to have a good year is? Not get angry on Rosh Hashanah. To not get angry. And there's going to be a lot of reasons to get angry on Rosh Hashanah. There's going to be a lot of reasons. I don't have to detail them, but you know them already. There'll be a lot of reasons. You want to know why? Because when the Yetzir Haran knows that something's important, that's the test that they're going to keep doing it. So somebody from your family is going to come and they're going to move the place cards or they're going to sit in the wrong chair or they're going to start eating the tongue before they're supposed to and you're going to, they're going to be ready to explode on them because you worked on that meal for hours and days and they're not waiting for you. And at that moment, you really have that test to say, hey, what kind of year am I going to have? Patient, forgiving, leeway type of a year? Or am I going to be back in my same self? And when Hashem sees that you resisted and you were patient, He'll show that same patience to you as well. Have a great day.